got a video here with the essential information you need for the alkanes. So we'll start with the general format of the alkanes. So in the table there you've got the name and the molecular formula for the first 10 alkanes. And these are what we call aliphatic alkanes, so they just have open carbon chains. So what is the ratio, the general ratio between carbons to hydrogens? It's Cn H2n plus 2, where the N stands for the number of carbons. You can also get cyclic alkanes, so they're alkanes that have formed rings. So there's three examples on the screen there. So we've got cyclopropane, so you can represent it like this, or the skeletal formulas like this. That's got the molecular formula C3H6. And then cyclohexane, C6H12. And then this one here is methyl cyclohexane, and that's C7H14. And hopefully you can see the general formula is going to be CnH2n this time. Alkanes are what we call saturated hydrocarbons. So there's a couple of examples on the screen. We've got ethane on the left with two carbons and butane on the right with the four carbons. They're called saturated because all of the carbon-carbon bonds are single. And they're called hydrocarbons because they contain hydrogen and carbon only. A little bit about the shape now and the bond angle that you would get in aliphatic alkanes. So these displayed formulae are two-dimensional and sometimes students think that because we draw it like this the bond angle there is 90 degrees. Well it's not. It's actually a tetrahedral shape with a bond angle of 109.5 degrees. And the same goes for ethane as well. So in effect we've got two tetrahedrons sort of stuck together. And all alkanes have the tetrahedral arrangement around the carbons with that 109.5 degree bond angle. And that's because each carbon has four bonding pairs of electrons around it. So we just look at the carbon in methane. We've got a pair of electrons in each of these covalent bonds, so they will all repel each other equally and that gives you that tetrahedral shape and you get that bond angle of 109.5 degrees. We we'll move on to boiling points of alkanes now, so we're going to look at how chain length affects the boiling point of alkanes. So we've got propane on the left with three carbons and we've got hexane on the right with six carbons. And there's the boiling points of those two alkanes. So it's minus 42 degrees C for propane and 68 degrees C for hexane. And so you can see that the longer the chain, the higher the boiling point. So why is that? It's because alkanes have what we call induced dipole-dipole interactions or London forces we can call them, between the molecules. And remember, alkanes are non-polar molecules. Now, these get stronger as the molecules get longer because there are more points of contact between the molecules. I'm going to show you a, a representation of that in a moment, so hopefully that will make it easier to visualise. So because these intermolecular forces are getting stronger as the chain gets longer, more energy is needed to overcome the forces of attraction between the molecules. We're not breaking bonds. That's such a common mistake. We're not breaking bonds. We're just overcoming forces between molecules. So we've got this slide to try and explain that. So on the left here, we've actually got four propane molecules. These are this, this is the skeletal formula for propane. And here's the intermolecular force. So it's a weak force of attraction between the molecules. And then between these four hexane molecules, 
that's a much stronger intermolecular force. So it's going to take more energy to break this intermolecular force than this one. So as a sort of answer for an exam, you could say stronger induced dipole forces or London forces between hexane molecules than propane molecules and therefore more energy is needed to overcome these forces and that gives it the higher boiling point. Obviously a longer chain still, so this has got six carbons. If you had a longer chain, say with eight or ten, the boiling point just keeps going up and up and up. Now if we look at the effect of branching on the boiling point of alkanes, so these are what we call structural isomers. They've got identical carbons and hydrogens, five carbons, ten hydrogens, but the degree of branching is different. So this has got no branching. This has got one branch, this methyl branch here, and this one's got two branches. The boiling points, you can see the one with the greatest branching has the lowest boiling point. So why is that? So again, I've got sort of a visualization like that. So hopefully from the previous um, slide like this, you can get your head around what's going on here. The intermolecular forces between the unbranched molecules are stronger than the ones with branching. And the more branching that we've got, the weaker the intermolecular force gets. So how do we explain that? Well, if I could move these on the screen, I'd be able to push these really close together. And what we can say is these unbranched alkanes have the most points of contact. Or you could say they have the highest ability for what we call close packing. You can pack really close together and that therefore gives them the strongest induced dipole or London intermolecular forces out of these three. Then if we move over to this one here on the right with the two branches. So this example has the least points of contact. These branches effectively stop the molecules getting too close together. So they can't close pack as efficiently. That gives them the weakest induced dipole or London forces. And that's going to give it the lowest boiling point. It's really easy to separate those. And obviously this one here has the one branch, so it has like an intermediate ability to close pack compared to these two. So we move on to combustion of alkanes now. So we'll start with complete combustion. So you can see there, alkanes combust completely in a plentiful supply of oxygen, producing carbon dioxide and water. So there's the example, unbalanced at the moment for butane. I just want to show you how I balance these. I've got a set order that I use. So I start with the carbons, four carbons in the alkane. So that means we'll get four CO2s. Ten hydrogens will give us five H2Os. When we double that five, we get the ten. And then I go back and I work out the oxygens. So we've got four twos at eight, plus five is 13. And I just always use an improper fraction, 13 over 2 times that 2 gives us the 13 oxygens we need. Incomplete combustion happens when you have a reduced supply of oxygen. There's two scenarios. You can get carbon monoxide and water, or you can get carbon and water. So we'll look at both examples. Again, we'll use butane. So this time we're getting CO, not CO2. So let's use that method. So we need four COs, five waters, and then count up the oxygens. We've only got nine oxygens now. So nine over two multiplied by two gives us the nine O's we need. And the example producing carbon now, again, four C's, five H2O's, that's not changed but now we've only got five oxygens on the right, so we need five over two O2s to 
balance the equation.